Welcome to Indiana University Cinema's virtual screening room. My name is John Vickers, founding director of IU Cinema, and thank you for being here for tonight's screening of Someone Somewhere, released this year from French director Cédric Clapiche. We're pleased to be joined tonight by James Nearmore, who I'll introduce here in just a moment. In addition to Jim's brief introduction, introduction to the film, uh, he and I will be back after the screening for a conversation about the film, about Klapisha's work, and wherever else the conversation takes us. So we hope you can join us for that by offering questions, comments, and, and just be part of the conversation. We hope that you're staying healthy and well. We miss you. We miss the experience of seeing you in our lobby, speaking to you, shaking your hands, doing elbow bumps, sharing stories, movie ideas, and well wishes. Uh, we will be back. The cinema vows to be back and even more inspired than ever when it's safe to do so. We're committed to returning as your place for amazing communal experiences and rebuilding our vibrant film community that you all helped us build together. So we will be here for you. In the meantime, thanks for continuing to engage with us in this virtual realm. Now, we're thrilled to have IU Cinema's good friend, Jim Nairmore here with us. James O. Nairmore is a Chancellor's Professor Emeritus in Communication and Culture English and Comparative Literature at Indiana University. He's received numerous academic honors, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a book award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and the Krasna Krauss Moving Image Book Award. His eight books and numerous articles cover impressive theoretical and critical ground, including the in-depth analysis of the careers of master filmmakers like Orson Welles, Stanley Kubrick, Vincent Minnelli, and Charles Burnett, to subjects like film noir, acting, the relationship between modern, modernity, modernism, and postmodernism, and even the death of cinema. He's truly considered one of the preeminent scholars in the field of media studies. In addition to all of that, Jim was paramount in acquiring the collection of Orson Welles' papers for the Lilly Library, and one of the consultants and drivers for the justification of a university cinema at Indiana University, which ultimately led to the opening of IU Cinema. So please welcome our good friend, James Nairmore. Hello, John. Uh, so we're going to see a film by Cedric Clapiche this evening. Uh, the first film of his I ever saw was in uh, 1996. It was a film called uh, When the Cat's Away, Chacun Cherche Son Chat. Uh, and it was about a, a young woman named Chloe living in the Bastille area of Paris who gives her cat to somebody to babysit, and the babysitter loses the cat. So Chloe has to wander through the Bastille neighborhood, knocking on doors, speaking to a variety of people, some people of color, different ethnicities, some people straight, some people gay, uh, looking for her cat. It gives us a tour of the neighborhood showing the changes Paris was undergoing, and gets us, gives us a sense of the a multicultural aspect of the neighborhood. This film that we're going to see tonight, uh, yeah, another Klapsish film, uh, uh, Someone Somewhere, also has a charming little cat in it that gets lost. But this film is both more opened out in certain ways and more closed down than the other film. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it makes use of popular formulas. You could call this film a rom-com, a romantic comedy, but an unusual one with a little bit of a, a melancholy tone and a tricky way of organizing the plot. Um, it could also be called, like other uh, Klapsish films, uh, a comedy of globalization. Um, uh, and he, Klapsish once said in an interview, I'll read what he said, he said, my films are about different people who end up being able to talk to one another. And that's certainly the case in, in this film. Um, there'll be many things to talk about, but uh, one of the interesting things is how this film plays now in a world that's cloistered and, and limited the way it is. Um, so we hope you enjoy the film. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, and thank you all for joining us for this introduction. I look forward to the, the conversation. Um, I do think there's a lot to talk about in this film, especially in this moment. Um, so we hope that you can come back and, and join us for that. Um, when I stop speaking here, um, you'll be able to access the link to our virtual screening room with film movement. Uh, there should be a URL after I'm done uh, that you can go to, or you can go back to the web page for this event and then access the URL there. Uh, we hope you enjoy someone somewhere and truly, uh, you know, please come back if you can for the conversation. It should be fun and be well if not. Take care. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you enjoyed the film. Um, before we start uh, the conversation with Jim, I'd like to make a correction. Uh, during my introduction, I mentioned that the film was being distributed by Film Movement, and it's actually Distrib Films, and you probably found that out on your own, but I just wanted to, to make that a correction for the record. Um, I liked what Jim had to say a lot in his introduction about the film, the timing of this film uh, seeming fitting. Uh, both characters are leading this these somewhat isolated lives, um, lonely or not lonely, but uh, how do you think, Jim, that, um, can, can you expand on what you were thinking as far as, you know, the time that we're watching this film and in watching films these days, how they're, they're different maybe than they were three months ago? Of course, yeah. Um, part of the, if, if you imagine that the virus has never struck <clears throat> and you're just watching the film that way, um, then it's, it's about some characters who could find each other and maybe even find a cat if they just look next door. Right. Uh, and instead they're, uh, they, they're, they're caught up in a kind of uh, digital internet uh, way of contacting other people. Uh, the only open spot is the, the, the grocery store. Uh, uh, and and I, I like that earlier pre-digital film, The Cat's Away, um, this seems more closed off. Um, on the other hand, it, it, it's like the condition we're in today. In other words, we could, we might have a friend or, or an important person next door to us, and we don't know because we're isolated. So yeah. I guess that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I I I, I like that. Um, there's there's a cut early in the film where we go from. Um, Remy riding the subway and you know watching people holding on to the handrails and then there's the cut to the microscopic uh, view of the cancer cells and you know that cut has a different meaning. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it reverberates in a totally different way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. and I yeah. find myself actually longing uh, when I see films like this. I mean, longing to be around people, and I don't know if, if you do. Sure, as well. yeah, and I think that's I think that's what the film is is about, isn't it? It's it's about uh, the need to, to be around people. That's what the grocery store enables people to do, although they just kind of wander in and out. They have, we have to get to the dance at the end before people get together. Yeah, you're right. I think it is about that, that human connection that they're, they're trying to find. And, and you know, it's not as though they're, they're, they're lusting after it. I mean, but they, they, they have something missing in their lives. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that your introduction to Clapiche was When the Cat's Away, and that was the same with me in 95 or 96. And I remember thinking that um, in that film and then subsequent films, he, he, he creates an environment where I would love to be. And, and maybe I saw those as a younger man. Well, I think you go to Paris, wouldn't we? Yeah. 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 Uh, but even, you know, Barcelona for the, the, the Spanish yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, but it just seems like the, you know life is vibrant in his films, and um, I don't know. If, do you have that same kind of takeaway? Yeah, or? I, I think Klapsitz is very much interested in young people, yeah. and um, so they <clears throat> they have a vibrancy uh, that's a that's very attractive. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, that's my short answer to your question. Sure. Maybe you have a uh, thought about it. There was a, a film critic, and I don't remember who it was, um, in, nine, in the late 90s wrote that, um, that he thought, it was a French film critic, and he thought that Clapiche was the most humanist of the French directors at the time, and maybe the freest. And, you know, his films are um, certainly playful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, I mean, do you have comparisons to other filmmakers that, I mean, does he draw any comparisons for you? Um. I haven't thought about that very much. Uh, I, I I know that he's a, he's an admirer of uh, excuse me of Robert Altman because yeah. of the ensemble work, uh, and that, that ensemble work is most apparent in the, that trilogy of films, the the, the Erasmus trilogy they're called, right. the Spanish Apartment, Russian Dolls, the Chinese Puzzle, I guess, and yeah. it's about the European Union's bringing together of young people for a year living, required to sort of live together. And it's about the confusions, but it's multiple characters and, yeah. and that, that sort of thing. I think he, he embraces the idea of a global community. Uh, he's critical of it in some ways, but uh, uh, I think that's what makes him a humanist. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I, um, 
that that trilogy especially it does bring together um, it's it's a number of students studying abroad in Barcelona in the first uh, yeah. first of the films and uh, I don't know how many different countries um, but yes they're all trying to communicate they're all trying to understand each other's cultures and differences and um, but then it carries forward um, you mentioned ensemble and um, oh, I was going to say uh, you asked me about other filmmakers yeah I think there's a little bit of a connection. Uh, with Eric Romer, um, uh, a, a French director who, did, who whose films are comic in a different in a different way, but uh, I, yeah, it has that kind of looseness that Eric Romer has uh, and ironies. Yeah, and a lot of uh, romance. I mean, yes. you know, and yeah, and I, I can see that. I hadn't thought about Romer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was, I saw some comparison to Ozone, but I was trying to think, I mean, Ozone doesn't have many comedies. Um, no, I, don't, I don't see that myself, I'm not yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so t thinking about the ensemble uh, casts, um, and we'll talk about the Erasmus trilogy, um, so that spanned, I think, over 10 or 11 years. Um, but he's, he's worked with several actors uh, throughout his films, and I, I don't know if I'll pronounce his name right, but Romain Duress, Duress? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think it's, it may be Duress, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but uh, uh, he was in, I think, the first film that um, Clapiche made. And yeah. They just established contact, so he, 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 but he's not in this film we just saw. No, no, but it, it, I was thinking about um, a company of actors. I mean, I think he's carried forward actors, you know, throughout his, yeah. his career, and uh, like many, you know, directors do. Yeah. Would you? Um, he's he's written all twelve of his films, is what I've read, and um, and you know, all of his films have pieces. Uh, not, not whether they might not be autobiographical, but they have elements of his life in them. And um, when the cat's away was. Uh, based on, I think, a former girlfriend who lost her cat in Paris. And right, right. would you consider him an auteur? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Uh, sure. This is the only film I know of his that has another screenwriter. I mean, he, it's, he's co the script is co-written. Okay. With, with a fellow named uh, Santiago, uh, I have to look up his name now, Ami Elaine, uh, who's an Argentine. Mm -hmm. uh, but has lived in Paris and, and uh, worked with French actors. Um, so I don't know how the collaboration worked with this film. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is an unusual film, it seems to me, in the way it leaves Paris and goes out to the countryside. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I don't know I mean, how that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was trying to think about that as, as well, um, you know, compared to his his other films, but... Uh, the other films are, are more metropolitan-centered, or, or uh, I mean, they travel around the world, but they're not, they don't, I don't recall them going out in the countryside very much. Sure, sure. Um, you know, while When the Cat's Away seems like a pretty breezy, light film in many ways, I, you know, I'd read that it was a critique <laughs> of, uh, of the gentr regentrification of um, right. Bastille District, and <laughs> Do you do you get those critical reads when you watch a French film like this? Um, I mean, are you able to? Yeah, and I think also the film we've just seen. Uh, um, for me, maybe maybe other people don't feel that way, but there's a slight melancholy tinge to it. Uh, it's not uh, comedy is such a broad category, and so many different things can be categorized as as comic. Sure. And I would say this is a comedy. It has a happy ending. As I said, it's like a, a rom-com, um, but it, it has little touches, gentle touches of social criticism in it, and um, uh, it, it gets to a sense that loneliness, the sadness of loneliness, even though these are young people. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, also thinking about um, importing uh, films, national cinemas, or say French films into the US. And uh, I had read that, you know, not all critics are a fan of Klapiches. Um, they right. consider him middle brow because he, right. he somehow bridges um, mainstream and commercial films with, with middle brow. But yeah, he's in a line, that's, that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and but but when when brought into the U.S. and brought into an art house market, um, do you think art house U.S. art house audiences would consider this highbrow? Well, I don't know about highbrow. Uh, it, it's not a deeply intellectual film. It's not complicated. It's easy to understand. It's entertaining. I think. Uh, no, I. I'm not. Some those terms, highbrow and lowbrow, those are. Those are not always accurate terms, you know, the yeah. oversimplifications, yeah. Uh, I would say that people would say that I, what I think about the film is it does fall into the category of an art film in the, the, the way Americans understand art films. First of all, it's in a foreign language and it's got subtitles and it doesn't have any kind of broad slapstick comedy in it. It's, it's uh, uh, it, 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 it assumes that we are worldly people uh, and, and can recognize ironies. Uh, so it has an intelligence, let's put it that way. And, and it, though it's using conventions, it's also uh, running away from conventions. I mean, the usual way of making a rom-com, a romantic comedy, maybe the old Hollywood convention of having a, mute, a meet cute at the beginning, that the couple has a meet cute, then right. they fall out, then they get back together. This is a film that has a meet cute at the end. Uh, so he's playing with these conventions in an interesting way, I think. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the the trademarks of Klapisha's films is, um, and, and you see it in, I, I've seen it in all of his films, I believe, is somehow he fragments the image. And, and whether it's done in montage and the, you know, in the editing or whether it's, you know, what he's looking through. Um, but there, there are, there are certain things that are maybe his trademarks, and I, I think that makes the strong argument for the auteur as well. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, what else can we talk about about this film? Um, I, uh, let's see. Or maybe we'll go to, if there are any questions. There's a question for Mr. Nairmore. Uh, what was your favorite aspect in helping to create IU Cinema? Meeting John Vickers, that was my favorite aspect, yeah. Uh -huh. No, and, and also uh, uh, the enthusiasm of the university president for the job. It, it went, uh, uh, President Robbie was, was strongly behind it, and so one felt this is really going to happen, and it's going to happen the way it should happen. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, uh, that enthusiasm for it um, was apparent in, in all the faculty and everyone that I met, you know, on my first visit here. I mean, yeah. you, you could tell there was a hunger for it. Yeah, I, I kept pinching myself. I couldn't believe it was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's and see. By, by the way, thank you so much for doing this. Hmm. Uh, I know it must be difficult for programming for the people in cinema in this period, and, and, but it's nice to be able to do this. Yeah, you know, of course, we'd, I'd rather be talking with you on our stage. Um, but you know this, this. This is something. It's it's uh, you know it's, it's a way to continue to engage our audiences, and there you know, there are some engaging. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another question for you, Jim, Mr. Nearmore. You said that the terms like highbrow and lowbrow, and even art film, can be misleading. Uh, how would you like to see film defined, or a film like this say defined? I I, I think I would I would I would define it in a, with other not categorical adjectives. I would say it's an, a pleasant, amusing, um, enjoyable, uh, rather Gallic uh, uh, insight into an area of Paris that's not very well known. And uh, it, it has a sweet quality to it. Uh, it's sophisticated, but it's sophisticated in a subtle way. So, I, so okay, it's not bridesmaids. It's not, uh, um, it's, it's not loud comedy. Uh, it doesn't make me laugh out loud. That's the way I would describe it. I mean, it's all right to call it an art film if, if, if one wants to, but. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, then there's another question. Um, John, how did your vision for IU Cinema change over time? Uh, who was asking these questions? Um, um, I don't know if the vision has changed. I think we had a pretty ambitious vision from the very beginning. Um, I think the the faculty, as I mentioned, who I met, had some pretty strong ideas of what they wanted to see, but they were they were broad and vague. Um, the president had some strong ideas of wanting to see something grand, and um, 
and so I don't know if the vision has changed other than I would say that um, in a very positive way, um, the programming has loosened up a bit. And, and so I think we've become uh, more engaged in the community in many ways. And I think we've done things that have drawn uh, you know, more community members into the cinema as opposed to a, a pure cinema tech. Um, and I think that's been really positive. And, and I credit Brittany Friesner, our associate director for, you know, the majority of uh, that convincing um, and, and, you know, showing the value in doing so. And so, um, but I don't think the vision has changed. I think, you know, we've always wanted to be a place for really great cinematic experiences. And we say transformative, and I truly believe they can be transformative and they are transformative. Um, but I, I, from the beginning, um, we've wanted to create cinema memories for people and I think we, we have. And, and, and so, yeah, I don't think it's, it's really changed much from the beginning. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Um, okay, question for both of us. What has been your favorite film to watch at IU Cinema? These are all IU Cinema questions. Um, Jim, do you have a favorite film? You know, all my life, because people know I love movies and write about movies and so forth, they always say, what's your favorite movie? Impossible, impossible to answer. Uh, uh, but um, when I'm asking what I saw at the Iowa, at IU Cinema, what really stands out for me, uh, I, think, um, I think the silent films, and especially the ones with the, with the music scores, the live music scores, those have been the most... Uh, unusual and memorable experiences for me. That's, that's my answer. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I agree with those. Um, gosh, there have been so many. And, you know, I think the first time seeing Lawrence of Arabia, the, the opening night was pretty grand for me with uh, the roadshow experience with the overture mm -hmm. and the intermission. Um, and it, it is, the first half of it is, you know, one of my favorite films. At, sure, at, sure, I mean, I, you, you can't miss with that. I confess I was not there. Uh, I can't remember why, but I, I I thought that was great programming to show off what you could do in that cinema. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, if you're going to open, you need to open grand, right? Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, there's another question here. Uh, what is the best film viewing space you have been to, and why? Not counting how you cinema, of course. Yeah, there are some great venues. Uh, if you want to. Take that, Jim. I don't know. You tell me. I've got one I'll mention, but go ahead. Okay. Um, well, um, you know, I've, I've seen a number of things at the Gene Siskel Film Center that I've appreciated, but I don't know if that would be the best. Um, no, I think I use cinema is better than that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, give. Uh, give I, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a biggie. Uh, uh, I can remember that Darlie and I were, <clears throat> were, in, were in Paris and we went to the McMahon Theater in Paris. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a famous uh, uh, kind of cult cinema in Paris. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's a huge old fashioned cinema, you know, with a, a, it's a gigantic auditorium and a huge screen. Uh, there were only about five people there when we went. It was a matinee or something. Um, and they were showing an old Betty Davis movie called Beyond the Forest. And uh, it blew me away. It just blew me away. Uh, it, 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 the size of the screen, it's all a black and white movie. Uh, yeah. well, a terrifically entertaining movie. And people came by an intermission and gave you a chocolate bar and stuff. Anyway. Uh, um, I, I've, thought of, I've thought of two. And... Uh, one is the Virginia Theater in uh, Champaign-Urbana, and it's a beautiful movie palace. And it's not always set up this way, but for Roger Ebert's film festival, they bring in uh, gear and technicians. And the technician, James Bond, projected a 70 millimeter print of Lawrence of Arabia there. That was an amazing experience. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I would have to say, and this is just a unique film going experience, but, but the the space made it so it was Grant Park in Chicago when they used to do their Chicago Outdoor Film Festival. Uh, uh -huh. 36,000 people and myself sure. watching. Uh, <laughs> watching yeah. TV. Yeah. Um, it was a pretty amazing experience. Um, I can remember going in again with Darlene to a theater in LA. Uh, now I'm going to blow it because I can't remember exactly 
where it's like, but once again, it, uh, this is a modern theater, gigantic, gigantic, uh, perfect sound, perfect image. Uh, uh, and they were showing um, just a kind of an ordinary uh, comedy, but uh, it was, you know, the, the theater was just so good. Yes. Yeah, there, there are good uh, ones. Oh, yeah, there was, Darlene just remind me, they were showing the Adams Family. Okay. <laughs> but again, there was only about two of us in the whole theater. Yeah. So that made it kind of really. I, I don't picture you watching the Adams Family, Jim. Really? Oh, come on. I'm, I got pretty broad taste. Okay. You think I'm a big intellectual, but of course <laughs> I am. But uh, no. That's funny. Um, here's, a, here's a question. Oh, let me tell you, I'll give you a little, uh, I'm going to give you a, um, I have to look it up here. Oh yeah, one of the one of the actors in um, one of the actors in in uh, someone somewhere. Uh, it is uh, Remy's shrink. Uh, he's played by a, 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 a French actor named Francois Bertrand. Have you ever seen him in a movie before? He looks familiar, but I, I don't know if I can okay. place him. Well, I'm a big fan of the Jason Statham movies, uh, uh, Transporter. Uh, he plays the cop in the transporter movies. Anyway, so I'm going to show you that I'm a low bra too. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Well, here's here's a here's a question for an average Joe or about an average Joe. How can an average Joe find a deeper appreciation for film? I don't. Gee, uh, I I think you have to come to it just enjoying it yourself, and yeah. there has to be not somebody telling you to enjoy it. And, and, and you have to be caught up with it or affected by it in some way yourself. And then, then if you wanna know how films are made, if you wanna know something about the history of film and that sort of thing, there are places to go to read or to be taught those kind of things. But nobody can, if you appreciate the film, it's a good film, so. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add um, a couple things. You know, if you want to, Trust a curator, um, and and you know take chances on things you don't know, and trust your know, recommendations of a curator. But if you really wanted uh, uh, some everyman lessons on on film language, um, I don't know, Jim, if you've seen Mark Cousins' The Story of Film. It's 15 hours. Um, it's a documentary. I, I have seen it, and uh, I have to confess, Mark Cousins had did something recently mentioned me as one of his favorite writers on film. So that's very nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like I like how he breaks you know down the language. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's very that, and that's it's very um, articulate and but but not complicated and uh, and he he even breaks some he breaks with some standard ideas so that there's some original aspects to it too. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll add and and um, you know this is this is me because I think. He was a critic who wrote for somebody like me, but I, I love the writing of Roger Ebert, and I, I know you know some intellectuals don't necessarily, but he wrote reviews for the Everyman. I I, I thought that. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I I said to somebody once uh, uh, that Ebert had the common touch, and I don't mean to I I I'm, didn't mean to be putting him down by saying that. It's sure. very hard to have the common touch and to do it as well as he did. Yeah. No, I mean, I can think of other other writers on film I enjoy more, but uh, he belongs in the pantheon of great American film reviewers, yeah. Yeah, um, here's another question. Uh, what are ways to make independent film, art film, or highbrow film more accessible to the general population who might normally just see Hollywood blockbusters? I don't, I think we do everything we can to make, make people be able to see them, you know, you, you're living in a world of, uh, of uh, home entertainment today where, you know, you've got Amazon and Netflix and so many other platforms with huge libraries of films. Or, and you've got the Criterion channel you can screen, screen, stream, and you've got IU Cinema. You just have to be curious about these films and check them out. And, and if you like them, great. If you don't, yeah. then you know. Yeah, and I and I would I would go back to you know it doesn't have to be IU Cinema, but I would I would find people you trust you know for recommendations and, and curation, sure. you know in this world, um, in theaters last year there were about seven hundred films released theatrically, 
Um, so there's no way you're going to see all those films, let alone try to, you know, watch any repertory or classics. And so, Absolutely. and so somebody has to help you sort through that. Um, if yeah. I had a gig once a yearly with, with film quarterly, picking my 10 favorite movies of the year and writing about them. Uh, but I started out with the proviso, Hey, you know, nobody in the world can see all these movies. There might be some far better ones than the ones that I saw. But yeah. I tried to pick some films that maybe didn't get around very much, so that people might want to check them out. Yes, I, I remember your writing on those lists. And uh, in fact, yeah. I think I still have an issue downstairs. Oh. Um, so here's a question. A common issue in the arts right now is determining if physical spaces are going to lose their importance as services like Netflix rise up. What is your argument against doing away with theater spaces or even for increasing Oh, so yeah, what's the argument for either doing away with these or even increasing uh, these spaces? Um, I mean, I'll start, but uh, certainly, um, and, but um, I, you know, the death of, you've written about the death of cinema. And no, it's, it's, it's not about the death of cinema. I'll explain that later, but go ahead. Oh, okay, well, oh yeah, I think it's the quote that is. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's been prophesied that uh, cinema would die over many different decades, and and yet I think the the communal film going experience um, is still very strong. Um, I think people want to go out to the movies; they want to be entertained. Um, right. I think it, it, they may be cautious, and it may take some time to rebuild. And there will be many players that drop out of it um, because they've, you know, they they can no longer afford to be in it, or they've lost their leases, etc. But I think there's always going to be communal spaces for watching media. And um, you know, maybe they'll eventually only be the subsidized spaces like a uh, university cinema or a museum, but I think there will always be communal spaces for watching moving images. I think that's, I, I, I think you're right. And, and you, you, uh, you have a better sense than I, of that than I. And, and uh, um, so I, I think that's correct. I feel like today, as a as a movie goer, going out to theater, not I use cinema, but uh, um, when I go to the commercial cinema, which I like, I, I always get nervous that people are going to make make noise or have a conversation in the middle of the movie or or something like that. And, and uh, uh, but that kind of problem has been around ever since there were movie theaters. Uh, yeah. So you know, but it's still better to see it in a big theater with people. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll answer the second part of that question, which I guess I didn't. And, you know, the expansion of those spaces. Um, a year ago, I would make an argument that, yes, um, you know, we've seen it with pop-up cinemas and, you know, small micro cinemas opening up around the country, even here in Bloomington with the Cicada Cinema. And there's definitely enough content to show. And so if you can build a loyal audience that trusts you as a curator uh, and you put yourself in, in tr interesting spaces, um, I think there is room for more content to be viewed in a communal um, environment. Now, it may take us a while to get back to that point if we ever do. Um, but I think if I was to answer this question a year ago, I, I would say, yes, there is room for more spaces. Um, here's another question, and this may be the last one or, or maybe one more. Uh, would IU Cinema ever consider hosting film appreciation workshops so people can learn more about the technical aspects of film? Um, I know Brittany and I have, have talked about these things and, and we've even talked about if we're doing this in a virtual world, doing something, you know, something to connect on events that might not be filmed. Um, I thought, you know, what would be a grand program at some point is doing 15 weeks of one hour sessions of the story of film on a Saturday morning or something to that effect, um, which I think could be an interesting program. And it would be, um, like Film Language 101 or something. Um, but we're also at a university that, um, you know, teaches film and film history and criticism. And, and so I don't know if it's the cinema's place to be doing this, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I, I don't know, uh, we obviously haven't done it, um, but it's something that we had talked about. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jim? Would you uh, be interested in talking to people about film appreciation or? Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to do it, but I I feel like I'm so old for that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'm. Yeah, whatever. Uh, uh, I th I think that um, you know there. 
there's there there might be a way i don't know how <clears throat> to have um, some kind of venue for adult education and 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 film and i could be linked to the iu cinema or something like that i i don't know yeah um yeah possibly and, and maybe good opportunities for grad students to help lead some of those sessions or right. yeah um, so this will be the last question. So there's been an increase in series-based film work, for example, Game of Thrones. Um, do you think cinema spaces will begin showing these episodes and elevating their importance in doing so, uh, perhaps on a week-to-week -week basis? After all, Nickelodeon used to play the news. Um, so it's a, it's a fair question. I mean, episodic television has gotten pretty great. Um, and you see, you see auteurs um, making episodic television now. Um, I, we haven't gone there. I mean, we've shown episodes, single episodes of things when we're trying to represent a filmmaker's work. Um, I, I don't know if I can answer that question right now, but. I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, um, it, uh, uh, it, to do that would, would be to challenge the model of what a cinema is. Uh, I mean, there are very long films that are shown in parts and that you can go two or three nights in a row. What, what's the uh, out one? What, what, what is the... Uh, it's uh, that, 13 that, hours. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 13 hours, right? Or something yes. like that. And, and it's for masochists who like to sit for 13 hours in, yeah. in a movie theater, but it's a great film. Um, uh, but it takes up so much programming space and uh, there is an art form for the two to three hour complete movie yeah but but this this new world of uh, of uh, digital platforms has created a something akin to the old Victorian three or four decker novel yeah you can you know just spin narratives out much further than before so but it's it's a question for the exhibitor I think yeah, I think, um, I mean, we did a Beyond Epic series where we screened a number of seven hour plus films. And one of them was an episodic made for television progr program by Fassbender, um, eight yeah. hours a week a day. Sure. Ellie, uh, oh, was that Berlin Alexander Fox? Um, well, that was also made for television, right? Yeah. Um, right? yeah, no, this was eight hours don't make a day and it was about seven or eight hours long. Um, so, I mean, the thought of doing it over the course of a day into making it into an event, uh, you know, is interesting to me. Um, the, the thought of doing it on a weekly basis is less interesting to me. Um, but yeah, but I, th I think, um, you know, somebody might have a different opinion and, and want to do that at some point. Um, I think we're going to wrap it here, Jim. Um, do you have any closing remarks? If not, then I'll kind of take us yeah, out. Just, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry my voice was a little off tonight. No, you, you were great. And uh, yeah, thank you for doing this. And um, we appreciate you spending time with us, but also thanks for everything you've done for IU Cinema over the years. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. Uh, remember, next week we have a conversation with Glenn Gass and Gabriel Lubell on A Hard Day's Night, The Beatles and Other Beatles Films. Um, finally, thanks to everyone here at IU Cinema and the staff, especially those behind the scenes tonight producing the event, Seth and Elizabeth. So thanks to everyone. Uh, we hope that you stay well and have a great night. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim.